had to describe improvisation to somebody who wasn't a musician, how would you describe it to them? Improvisation is basically instant composition. There's two ways to improvise. Some people rely on patterns they've learned and they try to you know, superimpose these patterns on chord changes. Or well, the other type of improviser just starts to construct a melody instantaneously and develops it and develops it and develops it just like you would in a composition. You want to give some examples of that, big boy? Oh, I don't know. Well, here, for, people can use patterns, you know. Or patterns, you know, or, you know. So those are patterns, or you can just uh, construct something. So you're not relying on the pattern, you're breaking it up. Obviously you use these little patterns as part of your vocabulary, but the idea is not to lock into these patterns and just play scales over things. Now, you've interestingly come sort of from jazz to legitimate music and back through jazz again. Can you talk a little bit about your journey in this marvelous thing? Well, you know, I started out as a jazz musician, then I got very interested in being a serious composer. I mean, obviously jazz is a serious composition, but I wanted to write for larger forms, orchestra, and larger um, time frames, where a jazz song is pretty much a head. It's A-B-A. -A. It's, a, it's a head and a chorus and a head. And jazz is a player's medium. If we had 100 piano players here, and we all played to say how high the moon, every piano player would play it differently because it's, it's the player's medium in let's say classical music or the world of orchestra and things like that it's a composer's medium if I had a hundred orchestras and you did the right of spring they're all going to be pretty similar because the composer dictates exactly how things are played if you play in eighth notes it's a dot it's just so, it's like a marionette almost you are so locked into that score whereas the jazz person uses the Composition is a launching point for his, his compositions, which is the improvisation. So it's, those are the two different things. But being more interested in composition, I just, for some reason, um, went into this world and I enjoy writing you know, concertos and symphonic works like that. But the same token, I enjoy playing jazz. I find that, for me, jazz is more enjoyable to play because every day it's different. So I never know what's going to happen, so it's fun. I find that if I had to play uh, classical music and I had to learn a Rachmaninoff concerto, for instance, well, it's not for me because every day you have to learn and do the same thing and same thing till you get that piece perfected. That's not um, for my personality. You've moved, though, from the written music, the composed music, back into jazz, though, and you've introduced elements of 20th century composition and even 21st century composition into jazz. Can you? Tell well, us listen, how you did that. I believe this, that art has to reflect the time. So if you lived in the age of, um, like in the 20s, they would play, let's see, you know, stride, things like that. But we don't live there. I mean, this is the year 2000, whatever it is. And our, the way we look at the world is different. So I don't go up and say, Richard, how do you do? What's not? It's like, what's happening, man? And I think that the harmonic language of jazz uh, is sort of stagnant in a way when I hear a lot of players using the same harmonic language as a way of expressing yourselves. I find in uh, classical composition, the, the harmonic language has evolved more, it's more distant, it's predicated on uh, different tonalities, and we're not locked into this type of minor, dominant, major structure that you have in a lot of jazz music is uh, improvisation is based on the 2-5-1. Or you can even make it a uh, cycle of fifths, but it still uh, you know, has minor and major. Whereas 
what I'm trying to do is take the language I use in the classical world, for lack of a better term, and apply that to, it, as in my band, The Body Acoustic, apply this harmonic language to uh, a jazz rhythm, let's say. So I have this uh, bass player and drummer playing, and then instead of using this language, we try to use a language more like... and improvise over this. So in my group, The Body Acoustic, I lay down this a modern palette, as you say, of colors. And therefore, the uh, soloists, Randy Brecker and Bob Mincer, they're forced to use this palette as a launching point to uh, improvise. And their improvisation has to be different because they can't use the traditional minor and major scales and things like that. And what I'm trying to do is trying, I don't know if it's successful or not, but it seems to be going rather well, is take the harmonic language and stretch it. And it has to evolve because just like in classical music, the jazz harmonic language must evolve. And it's okay if you see an older jazz musician uh, playing swing because he comes from that era, an older jazz musician playing bebop. But I feel that young people, 18, 19 years old, need to take this vocabulary and reflect the world they see around them and also take it and stretch it and take it into the next century. And sometimes I get a little disappointed when I see young kids up there and they're playing like it's 1958 or 1940 and then using this vocabulary. It's okay when you're in school, but I think as a professional, as an artist, things have to change with the times. And a lot of this jazz harmony we uh, improvise on now is uh, the harmony of Brahms or Debussy or, or Ravel. We need to as, uh, you know, make it a little more modern. It would seem that if musicians are going to be able to improvise using that harmonic language, then obviously they're going to have to understand it. And uh, I would guess that there aren't a lot of jazz players who have quite the experience that you have or quite the compositional knowledge that you have. I mean, how did Bob Mincer and Randy Brecker react to this new palette that you'd laid out for them? Well, they have such a uh, vocabulary that they adapted instantaneously. I mean, they can play this. These guys are seasoned jazz musicians, and they have really great ears, and you just adapt, you know? And, it's, and you know something? It's like that ice cream parlor basket of Robbins. Instead of 31 flavors, you have 32 flavors. It's a new toy. It's a flavor. The whole thing about art, I mean, if you look at Picasso, he was always young because he was inventing himself all the time. And the thing is to reinvent yourself and to try and do different things. Like, example, Miles Davis. You know, if you look at his evolution, in a short period of time, he evolved so far. And whether you like it or not, you have to give him credit because that's what an artist is always doing, searching, trying to do new things. Not He didn't get locked into the cool period or anything. He went through all these different phases. And I think that's important to grow and try different things. Of course, that really needs to be based on what's gone before so that innovation comes from knowing the tradition first, adding something else, and coming out with a third thing. Right. You're absolutely right. You see, the thing is, you can't rebel unless you know what you're rebelling against. I can't paint. So in theory, if I took a paintbrush and started splattering paint all over a canvas, it was the most crazy painting in the world. It means nothing because I can't paint a picture of, of you. In order to rebel, you need to take in the past few hundred years of music harmonically and rhythmically and then say, great, I learned this, this is fantastic now, I'm throwing this out and I'm going to try something new. But you can't rebel unless you understand uh, what you're rebelling against. It has to be done by young players as well. They have to learn to play inside, as we say. You know, They have to learn to play regular harmonic language and then they need to learn altered language and make it more sophisticated and learn altered changes. Then when they learn all that, then they've got to take it to the next step and start exploring and 12 tone, atonality, bitonality, polychords, and things like this, and, and maybe even different rhythms and to, uh, you know, try things. Um, I mean, Dave Brubeck did that in the back of his Time Out band, uh, you know, where he, you know, experimented take five and five four, and back then it was probably interesting. And, and there's all kinds of things we need to try, because jazz 
it's not a moment in time like a, the classical or Baroque period. Jazz is an ever-evolving, growing format and must reflect the time. I mean, I mean, I see, for instance, I know you're going to meet Bob Belden. I thought it was very interesting, the record he did with Tim Hoggins' Imagination, where they start playing against sounds. I think they just said, forget tonality, atonality, whatever. We're going to improvise against samples and sounds. And it's kind of interesting and nice because it's refreshing and they're exploring the possibilities. I mean, why does composition have to be predicated on 12 notes? Why can't we write, for instance, saying, well, I'm going to improvise against the jet airplane and then I'm going to, there's going to be a truck and then the ocean or uh, sounds of a collage? I mean, you know, the, the possibilities are endless. I mean, we, we only think notes because we live in the world of notes, but I believe in the future, the composition is going to be built up on taking sounds like you see the rappers doing now and perhaps in, in, a, in a more serious art form, people will intellectualize it and really create new kinds of compositional forms that won't be predicated on 12 tones. You've talked about presenting the players with a different harmonic language. What have you done in your group or, or in maybe some of your other groups in changing the playing field of rhythm? Well, I can say this, that it's hard for me to change the rhythms I use in my band they come from the Cuban Descarga rhythms. So that's the concept of the band, is to take modern harmonic language and mix it with Cuban Descargas. I mean, they're very... Um, Can you give an example of that for those listeners who aren't familiar with... Well, the, the Latin rhythm is... That kind of rhythm, and say, we'll, we'll take it and go... So we can take it and take the language, but basically the idea of the band is to have these grooves going. So the band has three elements to it. The first element is the first floor, is the foundation. So you have this strong rhythm that we've had, I guess in 100 years of Cuba, this discarga, these salsa type rhythms, which you dance to and you feel. And then we put this palette of a new harmonic language on top of it, and then we have the jazz improvisers on top of it. But we need that foundation. See, I believe sometimes free jazz doesn't work because there's no, um, everything is totally free and there's, there's nothing that pulls it apart. So if you have the rhythm free and the harmonic language all over the place, it, it begins to sound a, a little chaotic. You know, but the idea of the band is to keep it locked in so it's uh, danceable, grooveable, you can tap your foot to it, and then it, on, on another level it becomes very cerebral. Mm. But what I've learned from jazz is I'm trying to apply a lot of these rhythms to uh, my orchestral music and trying to take these dance songs and Cuban rhythms and apply it to an orchestra. I find that if you write, uh, since Latin music is a straight eighth, um, orchestral players understand it. I find that if you write a swing rhythms, even if you write them in 12-8 for an orchestra, they don't swing. If a jazz player plays, you write it in 12-8 for an orchestra, it goes, it sounds kind of corny and goofy. I, I think orchestras can't play jazz. It's sort of like getting an elephant to be delicate. But you can take some of these lat rhythms and very funky polyrhythms, and what I try to do with my, my new record that'll be out in uh, February, it's, it's the violin concerto and the flute concerto, uh, using a few things. First of all, instead we have a lot of palmas in there, and we have a lot of syncopated rhythms which are taken from the funk in the you know Latin world, and we're applying that to orchestra. So that's something I learned from growing up in the street and taking these street rhythms and applying it, uh, applying it to a concert hall. Do your orchestral pieces include improvisation? No, no. Okay. The orchestral, like I said, they're two different worlds. You know right. what I mean? It's uh, an elephant doesn't dance. An orchestra is what it is. Okay. Your harmonic language that you're talking about, the new playing field of harmonic language that you've imposed, of course, that's not free. It's a new pattern, if you like, whereas the older jazz had certain types of harmonic movement that, that were patterns that were common to that, you've merely chosen new ones, right. and, and, and so, in other words, you have to give those to your musicians and say, here's the deal, here's how we, this, this is the game we're playing now, let's do it. Right. Well, in the band, it's, it's different, because since we're doing Spanish music, the Cuban music, it's a discarga, so the bass has a pattern it plays. It plays that same, and what happens is the chords get superimposed on top of that 
root. So if the bass is going this, it doesn't change it. So these are superimposed against it, which creates tension, or you can uh, ease the tension. You know, if you play this, that's obviously, it doesn't create, but, but when you go, the pedals so in this particular band a lot of it is against pedals and a lot of the improvisation and in, in what I do is free but it's predicated on that pedal and tonality and we make up patterns based on this and also the the structure of the chords are different you know there a lot of them are predicated on uh, larger intervals I mean I have this philosophy why do we have to construct melodies and improvisations based around or diminished scales why can't it be? So I like to use ninths, uh, raised sevenths, you know, uh, you know, diminished flat fives and things like that to construct melodies and the improvisation because where is it a rule book that says you must play on small intervals? So by, and you know something, when you first hear it, maybe it sounds weird, but after a while, I, I think it's sort of like eating Thai food, you know? It's a li you need a little more spice and spice, and when you go to Bangkok, it's so spicy, you can't handle it, but the locals think it's fine. It's what you get used to. It's just like when I go sometimes to Asia, and I hear these gamelan bands or these Thai orchestras, I don't have a clue what's going on. I don't know anything, you know? It's, but it's like anything else, and I'm sure if they came here and heard a bebop band, it's, it's relative, you know, they have no idea as well. You've got another group that you were telling me about, uh, which is a, a semi-legit small right, yeah, ensemble yeah. that does include improvisation, I think. Right. Well, we're trying to do something new this year. We have a record coming out in January. It's called The Jazz Camerata. Carlos Franzetti, uh, who's a very well-known arranger in New York, uh, he's the writer of it. Well, he had another group called Orchestra Nova, and he just he did the writing on the Jazz Fattis, uh, John Fattis Remembrance record for us as well. But basically, you know, I have a label. So how much Schubert and Brahms and things like can I put out? And I was saying, you know something, I'm going to make a chamber music group. It's a string quartet, bass, and two woodwinds and a piano, and a saxophone. And I'm going to say, instead of doing classical repertoire, we're going to get songs from contemporary jazz guys, and we're going to arrange them without drums and put them in a, a classical style, and there'll be improvisations. So, you know, we did it, uh, Keith Jarrett gave us a song, we did Prisms with him, and Pat Metheny we did his Quiet Rising, speak to him about that, but we did these things in a not a jazz way. We adapted them for legit, and this is contemporary chamber music, and it's reflective of our society. So here we are, it's a chamber group, but it's playing music that's, uh, where it has harmonic movement that we're used to and things like that, rather than just going back and uh, doing chamber music from 200 years ago. And it also includes improvisation as well, because, you know, back then they improvised. You know, for somewhere along the lines, they probably set a rule, you know, classical musicians can't improvise, which totally baffles me because I dread the thought of not being able to play an instrument unless you had notes in front of you. This is kind of strange because I know in, when Mozart and Bach were alive, they could probably improvise for hours. And for some reason, we've taken it out of the vocabulary of the contemporary classical musician, where a contemporary classical musician is an interpreter, but basically needs a computer program called the Sheet of Music to run the program. And a jazz guy, you just say, let's play, you know, and there's something about that. So anyway, this group is a hybrid of this. We have improvisation and we have, you know, written ensemble playing. Can you give an example, because I think that's very important for people to realize that uh, guys like Mozart especially, and I believe Scarlatti, were great improvisers. Can you give a little example of how they might have improvised in, in their style? Oh, well, you know... Just, so, yeah, uh, just I, fake I, it. Think, yeah, because, I, I mean, I don't know the This shows what are. a great improviser did. Yeah. Whatever. I mean, I, I don't know. I'm saying... Yeah, I have to really get into that style. Uh -huh. But um, but they did, just like you know, people today can. <laughs> I mean, that 
that's just, I don't know what I did. It's just, it's a style, so you can just do the style. But I think to improvise, you really have to understand the style. My Baroque improvisation chops are not what they used to be 200 years ago. <laughs> they got rusty. Yeah, well, you, when you're 200 years old, of course, yeah, it's these difficult to play. It's just, I, I think it was the operation I forgot. Do you think that what you're doing, do you see other, other people going in the kind of direction that you're going in? Are, are there other, do you see other people? You know, I have no idea. You know, I'm not such a young guy. I'm 48 years old. But I'm saying that it just seems strange to me that I'm older and I'm trying to do new things and kids 19 are supposed to be doing this. And when you get out of school, trying interesting and cool things. And I find that a lot of them get locked into these traditions. And it just baffles me. I'm sure there's other people, you know, trying to do interesting and hip kind of things. And not to say that what I do is uh, going to be artistically accepted, but at least I'm trying. I do this for myself. It's fun. You know, we're getting some good reviews, whatever. But, I mean, maybe it's nonsense, maybe it's not. But I enjoy it and I do it for myself. You know, and it, it just feels good to play and it feels good to play in that style with that band. When I hear a lot of jazz and a lot of music. Most of it bores me. I've heard it all before. And again, it's just variations on a theme. Jazz records come out, you know, it's just the same thing. It's just another variation on a theme. Uh, and there's some schools that are trying to even make it more traditional, you know, and through corporate marketing, et cetera, et cetera. But I think it's important in any art form that art has to reflect the time. Take, for instance, rap music. Look, I I'm not a big rap fan, but... That is an accurate mirror and a representation of contemporary uh, urban life in the inner city of uh, a large uh, metropolitan area. Not to say it's my art form, for some reason we've adopted it as the art form of the country, but it's a folkloric art form. The same as if I went to Mississippi in the bayou and I heard people down there um, singing blues. That is their local folkloric art form. So rap, at least it's contemporary, and it reflects people's feelings that live in a uh, urban inner city life and you know like I said so you have to look at it as a folkloric art form whether you like it or not it's another story but jazz on the same token must do this must reflect contemporary city life contemporary New York life not a New York life of 40 or 50 years ago if a classical composer started composing uh, and using the harmonic language of Gershwin you know you get your head chopped off you know, but for some reason, in jazz, you know, we, we get locked into these things. Of course, that's also affected by the taste of the listening public. You're trying to innovate in one direction. Maybe there's some other guy in East Brooklyn who's trying to innovate in some other direction. And meanwhile, you've got public who don't get a chance to hear this stuff. I mean, unless they get a chance to hear it, they can't choose whether they like it or not. So how do you, as a person who's trying to create a new style of improvisation and a new, new style of music, how do you get that, and especially you as having a record company, how do you get the general public, music lovers, to, to, to get a chance to hear your music? Well, you know, this is a, a very serious problem you brought up. You have to understand two things. With the advent of the television and MTV, we've become a visual society. The metaphor used to be the word. We used to live in an abstract time, think, listen to music attentively. Today, the, in, uh, the metaphor is an image. Now, you have to understand this. Um, I believe that young people do not have the capacity anymore to listen to music attentively. They can listen while they surf the net or while they do other things, but when I grew up, you had no internet and things like that and you sat down whether you bought a Beatles record or Shostakovich you sat there with your friends and you listened attentively it was something you focused on we have the ability to do this in a movie like when you move, go to a movie you don't multitask you're not there on your cell phone and you're not there on the internet you watch a movie but for some reason music has become background you vacuum to music you surf the internet you have dinner to music we don't have this ability to listen attentively I think this is a flaw due to the education system in this country. We don't put a value on it. You know, at the end, you, you get the culture you deserve. So in this country, we talk a good game about, yes, we have family values, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But if you don't teach uh, art in school, you're not going to develop a, a consumer base later on. And we have two art forms in this country, I think, that are uh, indigenous, uh, Indian painting and jazz. 
And, you know, jazz is our indigenous art form, and we do nothing in this country to teach it in schools. We do nothing to preserve our jazz heritage. You know, what blows me away when I go to Italy and you meet some truck driver on the street, well, he may not know every Puccini and Verdi opera, but he knows who they are and respects them. I'm perplexed. I go up to a young kid in the inner city, and they have no idea who John Coltrane or Duke Ellington is. They don't have a clue, and they've never heard their music. Well, this says something about the, our American culture. I mean, we need, if we're going to develop a base for this music, you have to teach it. An analogy is if I went to a hot dog place or a hamburger place every day, uh, McDonald's or whatever, and then ate there for 10 years, and you took me to you know, Paris to the most incredible gourmet French restaurant, well, I haven't developed a palate that, to understand it. So therefore, it's not applicable. So this is the problem in this country. If we're going to have a jazz base around the world, we need to teach people about it so they understand it. You know, And this is the problem uh, I see today that we're not doing this. And my record company is a niche market. You know, I can't go out there and educate the world. We make audiophile and jazz and classical records for a small percentage of the people in the world that have good taste. And that's our market base. But it's a small market base compared to, you know, RCA, BMG, and Universal. But it's a niche market, you know. They're like these giant hot dog places and we're this little French restaurant and we have our clientele. And we do as much as we can in that small world to let our clientele know about this. But I have no delusions of grandeur. I don't expect the body acoustic kids in high school to buy it. I don't expect my violin concerto to be picked up in a high school or college. It's just not where it's at today. And it won't be until we readdress what was important to us. You know, at the end of the day, judge people by deeds. If we really cared about art in this country and jazz, we would teach it in the school along with history and social studies and mathematics. We're going to be these creatures with a lot of money living in, you know, I call it the age of the sheetrock. You know, you know I, I met you two weeks ago in Prague. When I was walking in Prague, I mean, you see the buildings from the Baroque era, and this, it's amazing. These were, um, not only were they functional places to live, but they were inspirational spaces. Today we live in the age of sheetrock, where everything is about functionality and existing. Do we live? We make more money, we have all this technology, but do we really live better than people did a few hundred years ago? You know, in some ways we do, but maybe the spiritual insight is a little more empty due to the fact that we have all these little gizmos to keep us occupied. I couldn't agree with you more, Dave. But I'm absolutely right.